Um, I'm just going to quickly introduce, I'm Stephen Henry Madoff, I've uh, organized Host and Guest, and as part of um, Host and Guest, the idea is that as exhibition, workshop, um, interventions of different kinds, screenings, have been part of what Host and Guest is. Anna Paula Cohen did six um, nights <coughs> of encounters with different artists, and um, there are these four strangers up here. I'm not sure what they're going to do, but they're going to do something. And what we're doing is we're sitting in part of the part of the exhibition that Hu Henru um, curated. So I'm just going to say uh, a couple of things. First, um, thank you to the French Embassy and to the French Ambassador Christophe Bigot for the support of um, the French government for the show and um, I want to thank Hu Henru for driving me crazy in many ways but somehow amazingly getting it done and um, so as probably all of you know Hu Henru is one of the most distinguished um, curators of contemporary art in the world he's just come from um, Auckland where he has opened the Auckland Triennial and what will happen tonight is that um, there will be some presentation of images and a conversation led by Hanru. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Um, thank you for coming. And again, you know, uh, thanks very much for the support from the museum, from the team, and also the colleagues, and, and of course the public. Before I forget, I also want to thank the artist. When you're a curator, you're constantly kind of a guest um, to be hosted by the artist. The artists are, are basically the people who uh, created a place called the home. Um, this home is actually is what um, we are living in, is the home of the art, right? Without the artist, we cannot have a home. Um, the, the issue that uh, Stephen brought up, it's a highly classical theme as well, being who is the host, who is the guest, um, and being inspired by uh, many um, philosophers, um, es especially Derrida's idea that uh, Stephen came up with this. I, I don't think it's simply a conclusion, but much more an open question about what, um, uh, what this tension between the host and guest is, and how much this um, how much this um, um, uh, encounter actually generate another set of relationship which is no longer distinguished by the separation of the guest and the and host. When, once it becomes a home, I guess, um, it's a place where the, the host will forget their role as a host, the, the guest also forget somehow their, their role as a guest. So the relationship would turn into something like a, a kind of merge of the, the deconstruction of the um, original identity of each side. And I think that's the, exactly the most interesting moment. And, and that's also the place where um, art can join in, in a way, because, uh, because of there is certain kind of uh, idealist moment, kind of utopian moment that we create together. Um, and art is really something that can bring us to um, a kind of uh, a sensibility, a kind of um, imagination about this home of being together, um, being together without um, uh, without a clear distinction of who is actually ha having the power of welcoming the other in the meantime, controlling the other, right? And and who also um, on the other side, you also have people who are <coughs> kind of uh, surrendering their their subjectivity to be embraced by the host. So that kind of relationship is somehow um, being blurred um, in this specific moment when you know the travelers go into a situation um, which is more like a, a kind of homecoming situation. I think this this is also a, 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 a eternal problem in human history that we get into all all kind of conflict because um, once we are hoping to to be um, living at home everywhere and actually encounter a lot of um, strange kind of reactions including resistance from the host 
So this is also, you know, what makes us really um, 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 have to deal with a lot of complicated issues of conflicts and so on. So when Stephen proposed this idea, um, um, it happened at the time that I was invited to do another project in China. It was um, almost two years ago, a year and a half ago, um, to be working with um, this uh, wonderful painter Liu Xiaodong, um, who um, was invited to buy the Cultural Bureau of the Xinjiang, um, not the province, it's called Autonomous Regions, which is like the Chinese um, administrational unity that defined in the 50s. They introduced this idea from um, the Soviet um, kind of um, uh, federation idea that um, having some re autonomous regions or in the, in the Soviet uh, situation is um, um, republics who joined the federation. Um, and, but um, the autonomy is based on um, the eth ethnical difference of people, so so-called uh, ethnic ethnical, um, minorities and also um, indirectly is also related to um, different cultures and religions. And so Xinjiang is one of these areas in the western part of China that um, China has uh, five autonomous regions, um, Mongo Inner Mongolia, Tibet, um, Xinjiang, and also Ningxia, which is called Ningxia Muslim autonomous, autonomous regions, which is also a very big center of Chinese Muslim. And then there's also one province called Guang, Guangxi, um, Zhuang, Zhuang minority, whatever, autonomous regions. So this actually created a very interesting kind of exception in the Chinese uh, political picture. And in, in the meantime, um, they also generate <coughs> uh, a lot of historical problematics, a lot of conflicts as well. Who, exactly the question is, who is the host? Who is the guest to be living in these areas? Are the so-called minorities from the Uyghurs or the Tibetan or the Mongolian, are they the real host? Or historically, actually, the situation is much, much more complicated. In each region, they're coexisting um, maybe 20 or 30 different kind of ethnic groups, and they all have been there for a long time. But for the convenience of some political reasons, um, for example, Xinjiang is called the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Regions. But the Uyghurs actually um, are not the only minority there. Actually, they're a majority in the region. But on the other hand, in the whole Chinese population, it's a minority. And in, next to Uyghur, you have about 30 different kind of um, ethnic groups from Russian to Mongolian to you know, um, uh, Chinese to Chinese Muslim and so on. So really, um, it's a very complicated situation. And, and what has happened is uh, for the last um, century, um, the, of course, for the last 2,000 years, this is the well, place, the region where the Silk Road, the famous Silk Road and went through. So the, um, it's a region where historically has brought in a lot of cultures from other um, parts of the world to China, uh, starting from you know, Buddhism, starting from uh, the influence from uh, Roman Greek um, cultures, starting from really a lot of Central Asian uh, influences. And, and it's also a frontier for a long time uh, defining the territory of China how the, the central government negotiate with that region, negotiate with the, the local uh, authorities, the local communities and local, um, there have been also a lot of um, different uh, states, different uh, empires, different kingdoms existing in the region over time. So this really interesting situation um, generates a contemporary kind of um, unsolvable situation which is for the last 20 years, especially for the last 10 years or so, um, there have been um, a lot of very violent confrontations between 
Um, we, we hear from time to time there's also um, and one of the uh, reasons is, of course, um, people start even comparing. Uh, um, there's a similarity between the, the Israeli and Palestine kind of tension um, between the Chinese and the Uyghurs. And there's also a kind of independent movement going on and so on. And what complicated the situation more is actually because of the last two decades, the rise of uh, political Islam in Central Asia has also influenced the situation. And of course, the, the American invasion in Afghanistan and also uh, e even com uh, complicated further the situation. So, so there's a really interesting um, possibility to think about you know, the relevance of somehow bringing this question to here. Um, so immediately I was thinking, you know, Stephen's uh, proposal falls very well into the project I was working on with Liu Xiaodong. Um, and, then, um, and then one of the, um, the, the reasons that, you know, I also thought art has something to do with that is because art is really dealing with the question of um, how the perception of reality and also the imagination of the home whose home, what kind of home that we can live in. Again, coming back to the beginning, um, that, you know, what I said in the beginning. So, so in a way, for me, uh, uh, I would really think um, art cannot do more, uh, anything like the politicians solve a kind of, you know, political and geopolitical uh, tensions, but, but can make proposals for us to look at the situation from a different perspective. And one of the major problematic, I think, in this kind of relationship um, is actually, uh, by extension, we can really think about Said's idea, Edward Said's idea of Orientalism, how Orientalist kind of reading of the other actually imposed a kind of political structure uh, of perception, a kind of political kind of power relationship between between um, the powerful one, how they look at the others, and by extension, of course, going to um, this relationship between the colonized, and the, the colonizer and the colonized. And this question actually um, falls into really exactly what art can actually propose to, for us to think about. Um, so through the eye of an artist um, going to that place, trying to coexist with the local situation from a very personal, very individual kind of point of view, rather than uh, embracing any kind of given political perception. Um, and what kind of um, uh, possibility that one can go beyond the uh, Orientalist reading of the other. Um, it's really something important. And I guess also this is the the approach that Liu Xiaodong, this artist who has been really working with uh, for a long time, and he's a <coughs> kind of realistic painter, you can see, very educated under the, of course, very um, academic system in China. Uh, from, and, and then he somehow uh, managed to go beyond this kind of official Social, socialist, realistic kind of canon, going into embracing another way of dealing with realistic paintings, which is very much in, somehow um, related to the influences of uh, um, the generation Lucian Freud, for example, and and then um, I guess the um, the new perception kind of paradigm developed through the, the history of contemporary philo uh, photography also has influenced a lot of his way of looking at things. So, so in a way, um, he used, using a very academic chained te technique, he managed to turn it into another concept of realism, um, another model of doing realistic paintings. Um, and by doing this, what is even more important is actually um, um, he would start his work uh, 
through um, a kind of a throwing himself into a real life experiences with the other, really living with these um, um, people um, in the in the place where he go he goes to, and he paints them. He co really live with them, co inhabit with them, try to share their their kind of um, um, life experiences, and and then turns his, his paintings into a research program uh, project. Um, so based on that, I. Um, I was thinking, wow, it, it's really nice to uh, kind of bring his project that we are working in Xinjiang to to develop an extension here, to develop a series of paintings. And so he and his team came here to develop, to work for a month or something, um, really to try to come up with the first step of this research. And, and next to it, of course, you know, I also thought it's extremely important that this project has a direct connection with the local art community. So I came here um, last year for quite a short time, less than a week, unfortunately, but um, have met um, quite a good number of artists. And among them, I have, of course, discovered three Genius um, from from um, uh, from the Israeli art community, and I think there's they're, they're working on you know very different um, issues, but there's something really common. It's really the somehow um, working on this idea of do questioning the perception of the stability of the the national identity, uh, either through the image of people all through the landscape, all through um, 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 real life situations. So for the Xinjiang project, uh, instead of having, um, basically I was invited to curate a one man exhibition. And it doesn't really make sense. When you're a curator, you, I mean the one artist, it doesn't need a curator basically. And so, so I decided to, you know, work with the artist really uh, as a kind of um, um, friend of dialogue. This time, instead of um, doing a one-man show, I proposed to work with another curator, who's uh, this guy Oning. This is Liu Xiaodong, who's here, and this is Oning, um, who is um, a media worker uh, plus artist plus curator, writer, and. Um, and he's, he's really, um, um, you know, multitasking um, uh, guy. I asked him to um, organize a research program on um, the cultural history and, uh, and uh, the cultural reality um, in Xinjiang in the area uh, as um, a kind of background research uh, to coexist with the painting program. Um, and the idea is really to use this opportunity to do a, a kind of overview or, or the beginning of an overview of the very comple complex, very rich cultural production in the region, which is very rarely mentioned in the mainstream discourses. And there's no, basically no uh, systematic kind of research on the history of cultural production from Xinjiang, uh, which, um, so, so it has a really a kind of um, a lack of representation. Um, the, the official representation or the mainstream representation that we see uh, in, the, in the cultural market or in books and films and so on are extremely uh, reductive. Ex extremely simplified, ex falling into all these kind of official canons of the other, very often organized in this kind of uh, paradigms of exotic orientalist kind of paradigms. So, um, so we decided to really start a research on um, all the independent um, voices, including writers and, um, and musicians and 
uh, artists, uh, craft people, and so on. So we are going to see a little bit of material. Uh, Liu Xiaodong, he, his work is really um, um, starting with going to a place to live and really work there. So every time he has to build kind of um, a temporary studio. And this time in Xinjiang, we chose to work in Hotian, which is one of the most important key cities in Xinjiang in the history of the Xinjiang. Uh, it's on the, in the center of the Silk Road. And, and apart from this very complicated uh, geopolitical history, and there's also a very important, it's also a very important center of uh, production of jade, mining of jade. Um, jade, as you know, in the Chinese culture is really something extremely important symbolically and also economically. So, so for the last 2,000 years, the production of jade has been continuing, and and um, and until today, um, you know, there's still a kind of um, a mythologic uh, uh, myth about the jade production from there. So whoever has a pure piece of a pure jade from Ho Tian, um, it's really symbolized the the fortune. Um, so um, of course, you know, as you see, the jade was mined in this kind of. Uh, a river uh, bank um, here, you can see. And what happened is the jade comes from um, every s uh, season, like um, when there's a flood from the mountains, when the, the snow melts, there's a flood coming from the nearby mountains. And they go down with the, um, push down a lot of rocks and fill up the the river, and then people start digging into the river, try to find the jade. And this practice has been going on for 2,000 years. So the river bed has been kind of turned around and around many, many, many times. So basically, there's no more jade there. It's impossible to find jade. But because of the myth there, and, and there's a to totally interesting kind of perform performance of industry. Um, so the um, this area be still remains the center of jade um, uh, uh, treatment and production, uh, the second, second hand production, let's say, and also a trading center in the world. So a lot of people who settled there to open their companies to pretend to be mining there, actually they would <coughs> transport the jade from other parts of the country. To be sell to to be sold in the area. In the meantime, you continue to have people who are digging, and who are using the huge machines to dig sometimes. And actually, this is much more like 99 percent of performance. <laughs> they don't really. Maybe once a year, you might have a guy who, who's very lucky, who has found a few piece of jade. It's like the gold rush somehow in California. They still have this kind of myth. So. So um, he decided to go to work there and live with the miners to paint them. So you can see he, he went there um, with a tent to set up the tents. And then he actually went to live with the people. And really, um, for, for a few months, he, he and the team um, of assistants went there uh, to spend all this, you know, trying to research into all kind of living situations, including this is, so you can see this uh, photos, uh, actually recording a little bit um, the process of how he research, and then he also does this um, diaries and drawings as a kind of preparation, and then this is the actual painting situation. He would just went to the site to have the workers to be to post there and then he would paint them directly on the spot. So the outcome is four major paintings after, after two months of uh, work and a lot of um, this small size of painting, uh, painting on photographs. And then four major paintings. And <coughs> they all named with the uh, direction. Uh, so this uh, is called East, West, South, North. There's four paintings. And then we decided to show them in, um, in Xinjiang first. And it happened that um, in the capital of Xinjiang, Wurumuchi, there's a huge exhibition center 
built in the Soviet time, uh, modeled on the in you know, the kind of Soviet kind of palace of ex exposition. Um, and um, as a curator, I wanted not to actually have the exhibition inside this palace. Uh, I was looking around uh, to look for a kind of old-fashioned school building. All the old buildings are demolished. And because of the urbanization, the urban expansion of the city is incredibly rapid. Then they took down all those old buildings. It was impossible. The only possible areas, um, uh, buildings would be in the areas where a, a lot of uh, Uyghur, um people are living, but because of the last few years of um, kind of insurgency happened there. Um, so it became too dangerous to go there. Somehow the relationship maybe, if you can roughly compare, maybe some kind of um, um, situation between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, kind of, you know, really strange relationship. So. Of course, there's no something like intifada, which is so visible. But really, there's some uh, some kind of tension happened, and especially for the, uh, I think in 2006, 2006, there was a very very big event that um, some Uyghurs actually killed some Chinese on the street, and then the the whole city was um, taken by the army, and there's, there's a really a very intense situation. So, so that created a certain impossibility to to find the site. So we have to go back to the, to the um, exposition center. So this exposition center was huge. And they gave us a very big room, which is about 4,000 square meters. <coughs> and you can see here. So I decided that went into this room. I decided to actually to only ch choose four paintings to show them in one wall. But before we go into the space, I decided to ask them to lower the, the, um, the gate. So you arrive there, you have the gate open up to only on your head. So you go into almost like you have to bend your, your back and go inside. And then you, when you go inside, it's like immense space open, complete. So I asked them, when I visited the place, they were full of kind of rubbish, you know, old chairs, old furniture, and dirty, and so on. I asked them not to clean, just keep, keep them as it is, and then build a wall in the middle. And this is kind of curatorial trick, to create the kind of monumental feeling that you walk, walk into this place, the tension between the, um, the artistic kind of um, sublime and um, and the environment, which is totally um, almost like a ruin. So that's, that kind of tension actually add another kind of uh, life to the, to the project, I guess. So you can see these four paintings well shown in this way. And this is the opening. And I think it's really a nice party. And then a few months later, it went to Beijing. It's a different situation. It's in the in the Today Art Museum, which is also a very big space. And then this time, we tried to come up with a much more complicated picture. Um, so of course, we built the wall, and we're going to so somehow recall what happened in Xinjiang. And then next to it, we f um, feature the film. This film, actually, it's this one. Um, Liu Xiaodong, for the last few years, um, he has been working with a different film crews to document the process of his research and, and, and painting. And they all become independent films. One of them actually won a very important document, uh, prize of a documentary film in Taiwan, um, directed by Hou Xiaoxian. You might know uh, this famous uh, uh, film director. And this time, he worked with a very young guy called Yang Bo. I think he also came to, came to Tel Aviv to work on this film with him. So we actually uh, featured the film, show the film as if uh, it was shown in a public space. It's like a public square almost. So, in the, so next to the painting, we have the films. And then the, on the back <coughs> side of the, the room, we actually created um, a room which is like an archive. 
kind of a presentation. So you have the presentation of all his um, uh, diaries and and sketches, and then we also show some old sketches he did on his first trip to Xinjiang in the 80s. So we have kind of you know uh, trying to bring more kind of historical background on how this artist actually was engaged with the situation. And then smaller works. And then the photos actually originally was, was shown in this way. And then next to it, we also have a, a place where we show all the research. And we come to this research, which is Owning's, um, he led, uh, my co-curator, he led this researching program starting with um, researching the books. So he actually came up with a book list, list of books related to the question of Xinjiang's culture. And then he had that, this diagram, which is called the, the mind map of research of Xinjiang. So he created a kind of a research program related to some major themes and so on. Um, and then starting there, we went to Xinjiang, actually, as you can see, um, he and his team, and also later uh, Liu Xiaodong and me, we joined the, the research team as well to travel to different cities in the in the region, really trying to look into, for example, of course this is a typical everyday life situation, the restaurant and so on. Um, it's not very different from somewhere you can see in East Jerusalem maybe. Um, and then uh, this is Kashka. Kashka is a very important city in Xinjiang, um, being um, uh, one of the capital, of the, the capital of the one of the most important kingdom uh, during the last 2,000 years. Um, and it was really important kind of key city in, and also what is important is actually it's, uh, they kept an area, the old city, which is um, entirely made of mud. So it's really on the city, it's like a living fossil of a, mid, a middle age, Central Asian city. Unfortunately, um, um, because of the urbanization now, the modernization, the Chinese tries to develop a trading relationship with um, the Central Asia countries. So they decided Kashgar is the base. So they're having this urban planners from Shenzhen, which is like the, um, the city next to Hong Kong was entirely invented during 20 years from a village of 20,000 people to now a city of seven, more than seven million, um, only within 20 years. And this guy actually was invited to go to Kashgar to change the city. So what they do is actually they basically build a modern city and very quickly they decided to, you know, they don't understand the, the, the traditional architectural kind of um, sustainability. So they decided to renovate the old city, thinking that you know um, this is made of mud and it's not stable, there's a lot of earthquake. Actually what is interesting is this area has a lot of earthquake, but for the last 2,000 years, these buildings actually existed, uh, continue to sustain while the, the solid buildings all fell. So they couldn't understand that and then they decided to you know, renovate it. And also there's a reason, of course, a typical gentrification, that this is in the central part of the city. So this is the most expensive land. So they, by you know, kind of renovating it with you know, new materials, they try to actually kick out the original community. And turn them into a touristic area. So that's also a typical trick in urbanization today. But so we went to research this area and, and then really to find out you know, what's, how, um, how interesting this area and try to develop the first research. Of course, there's some kind of architectural students and so on, they, they have done some research but there's never been a systematic publication, so we try to develop this project now with some uh, researchers there. And then we also went into a research of the traditional music and dance, and meeting with, you know, this is, you know, for example, this is the, um, 
typical kind of Central Asian um, uh, music and dance scene. And this happens in the park in the afternoon, like Sunday afternoon, really like a popular activity. And, it's, and now this, this is a being increasingly kind of reduced and turned into a theater <coughs> kind of setting and using as a kind of um, part of the official representation of Xinjiang culture. So we try to really um, um, collect as much as possible the, the living situation of the, these activities. And this is some stream musicians. And then um, again, you know, we went to uh, talk to this, these guys. The, uh, this is like a very independent kind of um, musician and researcher who struggled for many years to try to defend the original of, uh, way of doing music and so on. And then we also went to, went to uh, visit some independent writers of different ethnic backgrounds. And for example, this Chinese girl, she grew up with the, the Kaska, uh, with the uh, Kazakh um, nomad community. So she actually traveled with them and wrote some really beautiful books. And she never went to a university or so on. But she is maybe one of the most wonderful, most beautiful writers of her generation, and, and so on. So you have, and then um, at every step, we host um, a seminar as a kind of you know, presentation of our research and inviting the, the people to come. And then there's a performance. And then um, this is um, the step in Beijing. So you can see, you know, basically this project, I give you a, a kind of a background to why we arrived here um, to do this project, which is not simply um, a presentation of paintings, really about an ongoing engagement with um, this uh, research uh, process. So that's, I think, all the images I have. 